All right, wait for it, wait for it, and we're live. Now we show that beautiful footage. Boom! That's right, we're making this movie review in conjunction with Upstream Reviews. Why? Because they share it, and that hopefully gets people to watch it. That's why. I I I'm greedy like that, Nick. All right, all right. Oh, yeah. So, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blast Vision Blades podcast. Just a couple of nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. We are the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my overly caffeinated guests and ask them the religion question. Are you two, lady and gentlemen, ready for this? Ready. All right, given the topic of tonight's movie review, religion question that we start with, do you like marshmallows? Yes. All right, Stabby, you've got to unmute so you can use your pretty voice. I don't want to. My head shake should be enough. Yes, I like marshmallows. Life. I like marshmallows. I like toasting them. I like putting them in my coffee. Marshmallows S'mores are good. Are good. Uh, hot chocolate with s'more uh, marshmallows is good. I'm, I don't really like them in coffee. I'm weird when it comes to s'mores. I buy all the stuff for s'mores, and then I just eat the marshmallows. Eh, I mean, they are kind of addictive. Do you like the big fluffy ones or the tiny little pellet ones? I like the big fluffy ones, but I also recently found marshmallows that are stuffed with chocolate. Wait, what? Okay, back up, back up. Talk to me again. So it looks like a regular campfire marshmallow, and you toast it like one, but there's a chunk of chocolate in the middle, so as you toast it, it melts the chocolate. So you don't even need the chocolate for s'mores anymore, because it's in the middle, and then you just put your crackers. But I just eat them straight up, and it's just marshmallows and chocolate goodness. Is the, marshmallow, is the chocolate inside, if you don't heat it, kind of like dry and stuff? No, it's soft inside, and then when it melts, it's like fudge, like hot fudge. Yeah. Have you tried this to vouch for her, Nick? Okay. All right. Well, if you have tried it, you should let us know in the comment section because I saw that once and thought it was heretical, but now I might have to try it just to be open-minded. So we don't want to be food bigots up in here. No, nah, we got to try all the things. Try all the things. All right. So because we never just ask one question. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, Attack of the Killer Donuts, or Attack of the Killer Lemons. I, I'm going to throw in secret option number four, which is a movie called Rubber about a killer tire. <laughs> See, I was going to go with kill, secret option number five, which was Attack of the Killer Clowns, because that's the reason so many people are clown phobic. But for me, clowns are always bozo, and he gives you Otis Spunkmeyer cookies and Schwinn bicycles. Yeah, but then you got John Wayne Gacy, who was another clown for other reasons. Don't you don't you besmirch my chocolate chip cookies? <laughs> Besmirched. Hold on, I gotta look that up. So you throw a lot of big words at me, JR. I'm gonna have to take them as disrespect. <laughs> no, Bozo the Clown had a uh, like he was a long running like daytime uh, game show for kids. And he was the host. And, of course, he was always, you know, Oprah gave everybody a free car. He gave people Schwinn bicycles and a lifetime supply of Otis Spunkmeyer cookies. Otis Spunkmeyer cookies. He is probably single-handedly uh, handedly the um, cause of diabetes in our generation. That lifetime supply of cookies. I think it's processed right? foods. Yeah, but a life, yeah, a life supply of cookies would also add to the obesity problem. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Stabby, weigh in. Hmm. I'm going to have to go with Attack of the Killer Donuts. Because I nobody expects their movie. donuts. Nobody expects their donuts to come after them. Are they cake donuts or yeast donuts? They are sprinkle donuts. The sprinkle donuts. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, like nobody ever believes me, but that's got to be the scariest thing ever. Like you expect clowns to be evil. Learn that one young. Tomatoes, eh, are they a fruit? Are they a vegetable? Kind of seems a little evil to me. But donuts, donuts are supposed to be just nice. 
Yeah, that is kind of duplicitous. All right. Uh, because we are civilized human beings, we are no longer knuckle-dragging troglodytes, at least not Nick and I anymore. Iced coffee or iced tea for the summer? Well, I'm going to have to go with iced tea. Uh, see, I like my iced tea so sweet that it's bad for my diet, but I can get iced coffee to be relatively low in calories, get some of that sugar-free French vanilla syrup and a little bit of cream. Oh. And I can keep it under like 300 calories. Well, that's why I go with unsweetened tea, like sun tea, and then throw ice cubes in it, a little bit of lemon. Good to go. See, the problem with with, with sun tea is it's not sweet tea. And, and I'm in the South. Tea should be sweet, yeah. iced. It should have enough sugar to hold the spoon up. It should spike your A1C. Absolutely. And if it doesn't, you're not doing it right. Uh, in the South, we call that table wine because it's so sweet. It might as well be its own thing. But I, I don't let myself have that much of it because, well, you know, dieting, trying to get healthy. Um, the only time I let myself have sweet tea is on occasion. I'll do it when I go to Chick-fil-A because I'm told that that sweet tea is blessed by the Lord. Uh, or when I go to Mission Barbecue because it is too good to say no in America. Uh, and they are a barbecue chain. I don't know if you have them out in California. But they are a barbecue chain that they donate a percentage of their profits to first responder charities. Mm. Um, they used to donate to um, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Um, but then they had that scandal a few years ago. They cleaned it up. But, yeah, they uh, I guess the amount of money making it to the charity versus pay was problematic. Um, they've since changed that. But right when that happened, rather than get caught up with it, they distanced themselves from that charity. And they started uh, backing just local first responder charities, so local to the individual store. So, like, the ones in Hampton Roads donate to the Navy Relief Society, the SEAL Team Veterans Foundation thing for the, the uh, what do you call it, the Orphans of SEALs. So, there's one of those charities they donate to. They donate to the same thing for the Marine Corps. And then, of course, local cops and fire departments. Um, and then, if you were in Boston, it would donate probably to the Boston PD and fire department, that sort of thing, which I like because it keeps it local and charities should start at home. Yeah, so, I dig it. And their sweet tea is, like... It's approved by the military, so you kind of have to drink it. It's like orders or something. Yeah. And they actually have a table at the one near us. It's it's mine. I have claimed it. Uh, on the last uniform I wore when I left country from Iraq, I cut that patch off, and they have that on display at the uh, at the booth because they decorate with all these patches and stuff. So they've got my sergeant stripes off of my uh, class A's and my Screaming Eagle patch. But it was made by, like, the TCN um, so seamstress that was at uh, um, Balad. And so it kind of looks like a Screaming Chicken. And that really what was that? Uh-oh. Anyway, yeah, so it looks more like a chicken than an eagle. Um, it's almost heretical. My uh, first sergeant, when he saw us getting those, thought maybe the hundred or the eighty-second had snuck in there and like messed with us. Um, but then we saw their patches and their double A's look like eights. So you know, I guess they got oof. screwed too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of that oofing going on around that day. But anyway, all right. So you kind of have to drink it when you're at mission. If you guys ever come out to this coast, I will treat you some good southern barbecue. I'm, I'm all for. It. I like barbecue. I Do like they meat? have like? California style barbecue, or do they just is that just an East Coast thing? I don't know. Yeah, it's a vegan <laughs> shit. No, oh, that's cool. there was a place on Coronado called uh, what the hell was that called? Um, anyway, but I walked over there one day and it's a barbecue place and they do have barbecue and it's pretty good, but then they had like, oh yeah, come get your vegan pulled pork. And I'm like, what the hell is no, how do you, how do you have vegan pulled pork? It's from a jackfruit and they just barbecue it and grill it. Or smoke so or whatever. my favorite are the uh, barbecue places that are all over that um, pork butt is so they make butt jokes as part of their title. And I just laugh like a little 12 year old every time I see them. Um, it, it never gets old. Never does. Oh, no, never does. <laughs> all right. All right. So next, we're gonna, joke. who doesn't next? We're going to introduce the uh, the topic. So basically what this comes down to is, oh, stabby, go. You skipped me again, JR. What did I skip you on? Iced coffee or iced tea. I thought you, oh, because you answered in the pre-show, and that's why I remembered. That's um, just rude. I apologize. You know what? In, in, There's three people in this podcast with horrible memories. 
Yeah, um, so you just need to snap Nick to make yourself feel better since I am safely on the other side of the country. Uh, just wait until you get the chili I sent you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my butt will never be the same again. All right, sweet uh, iced coffee or iced tea? I like them both, but I like um, I like lemonade. You had to be uh, outsider today, didn't you? All right. So when you make your iced tea, because you taught me to put the iced coffee with actual coffee and ice cubes, do you make mm -hmm. tea and then make tea ice cubes and then put that in your sweet tea to make iced tea? You can do that, actually, yes. Um, but no, I just use my regular ice with my iced tea. Um, right now, we are doing sun tea. Um, I just actually just brought it in. So it's been out all day long. Um, we're doing sun tea right now. I haven't made sweet tea in a very long time, but I used to live in Louisiana and it takes more sugar than a packet of Kool-Aid. Dang. Yeah. To make sweet tea, like to make legit Louisiana sweet tea, it takes more sugar than a packet of Kool-Aid. And I was like, woo. So I'm, I'm so sticking with my sun tea for right now. I am not brave enough to actually measure out my tea. I just dump cups at a time, which is why I don't make it at home anymore. Because so here's here's the, here's the kicker is I don't like my lemonade super sweet either. I don't like, like lemonade. I can't do like that. I like lemonade. Um, I like it as like a splash in something. So like I like strawberry lemonade or blackberry lemonade or blueberry lemonade but i don't like it when it's just straight up like either overly sour or overly sweet so like hot dog on the stick i don't mess with their lemonade it's too much all right so nick do you have your flak jacket on so i can ask this question or make this statement no but i can take it all right all right so i ordered on your recommendation stabby the blueberry coffee and i have to say i was not impressed <laughs> well, Nick, you don't need the bunk here. Do you have well, I could just send it to you. No, we we get, we got rid of the cake. <laughs> Nick is retreating. <laughs> no, we got rid of our cake up things um, back in Vegas. We left it with my parents. Uh, I like you know I like drip coffee, and that might be why yours isn't so good. Because when I order from Coffee Brand Coffee, um, I do whole beans. And then I grind them myself. So you can control the strength. So, so it tasted like weak blueberries. Mm -hmm. And then it was just yeah. a little bit slightly burnt. I felt like if I could somehow like make it more blueberry with, I don't know, like blueberry creamer or something, it might've been enough to make it good. It's just, it was, I don't know. It just wasn't for me. I've liked their other coffees I've gotten though. So, so Nick, the trick nice that I do when he bandaged the blood. <laughs> so we appreciate that. So the um, what I do with the blueberry ones is we order all of ours as whole bean and we grind them up ourselves because um, I don't do blueberry every single day. But we bought their um, the Guatemalan coffee and it's like a chocolate and lemon based, like um, not even full lemon, like lemony. Yeah. So it's chocolate and, and lemon based. And then I would put some of the blueberry beans in with it when I ground it. And it was like chocolate covered blueberries. Nice. So and then uh, I would use uh, the peppermint mocha creamer in it. So we've officially sold 10 to our, our discerning guests, which means we are officially partners, which means they give us a little bit more of a kickback. Uh, so with that, we got one free. Um, thank you for selling our coffee. Uh, pound of coffee that Stabby and uh, and Nick claimed because they drink a lot more coffee than I do. And so I figured I'd let them try it. So what did you order? I ordered the whiskey flavor or the bourbon flavored uh, whole beans. Okay. I have noticed no. that as we're covering fatties, Nick, both of us tend to do the first, I don't know, 15 minutes of our show. We talk about food. Yeah. I, I have no problem no, with it. No, no. Observation. Well, I mean, especially now I've been, I'm three weeks doing the carnivore diet. Not, it's a dirty carnivore because I do some keto stuff on it, but it's all just steak, eggs, cook things in bacon grease. And it's like, it's been amazing. I, I dig but it. I, I, um, somebody brought cake into work yesterday. Ooh. Like, 
and I had a slice, a small slice, and it jacked my guts up <laughs> with all the sugar. So I've been doing the uh, – when I take my mom across town to go to her PT appointments, uh, I go by Duncan's drive through and I get one of their cold brew iced coffees because we do not have a coffee brand coffee drive through coffee place here, and we should. Wow, that's a lot of coffee, saying. Um, and so I've been doing that in one apple fritter. That's my one dessert a week is a Dunkin' Donut apple fritter and their iced coffee. But their iced coffee, if you do the cold brew with a loaf with the sugar-free um, syrup and then just cream, it's just dairy. It's actually not that bad. Like I can drink like thirty something ounces, whatever a large is, and it's under three hundred calories. So both Nick and I have realized something. So. Like, if you've ever been on our show, if you've ever listened to our show, anything like that, we all know that Stabby has stomach problems. Um, and I've been trying over the last couple of years to figure out what triggers it and what doesn't. So in the last couple of weeks, I have completely stopped um, buying store bread, store tortillas, store biscuits, all that stuff. And I started making it all from scratch. And... Um, and I'm actively weighing stuff as I do it. And it turns out that one loaf of like the gut health bread from the store has 24 to 26 grams of sugar in it. Whereas when I make homemade bread from scratch, it only has four grams of sugar in the whole loaf. So, and it doesn't hurt me as bad. So it's gotten to the point where I make our tortillas fresh. I make our bread fresh, our biscuits fresh. Um, I've been making homemade cookies. So it's like I'm being a bit more cautious and Savvy's not having as many stomach problems with it. But when we do eat out, when we do eat out, both of us are like, we need a bathroom now. I mean, at this point, like I used to do eat out, that was the occasional, like, I don't know, McDonald's or Burger King or something like that. But fast food has gotten so expensive. I'm like, well, crap, I could buy a steak and cook it at home for this price. So I just don't eat out mm -hmm. as much. I noticed a huge, like, I can cook the same thing I eat at an outside restaurant and get about a third of the calories for some reason. And I yeah. weigh everything I eat. And like the, I use the, um, the lose it. It's L O S E space I T and an exclamation point. We are not sponsored by them. I just highly recommend it. I pay for the membership to it. And uh, it lets me, if I'm doing something like I can either scan the ingredients or I can make a recipe. And so I can track based exactly on what I'm cooking, uh, and mm -hmm. what I'm consuming. And so like, I, that's been the biggest key for me is when I eat at home, like I can eat till I'm full and still have calories left. Cause as a guy, I think it's like 23, 2,300 is what it says is a good um, calorie. Although I don't know how much that's based on height and weight. The amount of daily calories, Nick weigh in. Uh, let's see here. He's going to look it up. Uh, there's a calculator that I have um, that'll tell you what your maintenance calories are for your current weight. Um, I'm at 215 pounds. So my maintenance calories somewhere around 2,500 calories a day. So I, I know when I entered mine, I entered the height, the weight, and then what I wanted to get to. And it says you can do like four levels, slow and steady. Um, then it was like a little bit harder, a little bit harder, and finally like beast mode. And I did like the, the you know, the third tier, not quite beast mode. So that's where it came up with a 2,300 a day. Uh, and then it'll add more calories if I do like a lot of exercise. But I, I never use those extra calories because – you know, that's just free, free calorie burn, you know? Yeah. So, all right. So now that we've gotten nerdy with it. All right. Uh, so today's episode, 20 minutes in, uh, is we're going to do a movie review of this stuff. Uh, we are serving the interest of Madam Stabby Stab, uh, mostly so she doesn't sacrifice Nick at the altar of her boredom. She said that uh, we haven't done enough podcast topics that interest her because Nick and I get nerdy on different things than her. She wants to talk about mutilated bodies and horror and poltergeist we want to talk about spaceships so sometimes we've got a humor <laughs> in all fairness hold on in all fairness i have not i i have not turned the tv this week or last week until nick gets home and then we watch tv together um so in the last 14 days i have read 16 books Nice. What uh, what books are they? Ones we can talk about on air, or do we got to go off air for that? Uh, no, I can talk about them. Um, yeah, I can talk about them. 
I did um, the Four Horsemen series, which is about, you know, the end of the world and the apocalypse and and the Four Horsemen finding love and, and faith in humanity, which was amazing. And it made me cry at the end. Um, hard. It, it was something. It was something. <laughs> and then I did um, half of the series because I'm waiting for the other half to come in the mail this week. Um, I did a half a series about second chances for soldiers, which is kind of great. Like um, she mainly leans on, um, on Marines. I should say, actually she she's, I think she's from Oceanside. So that would make sense with Camp Pendleton being over there, but it's a whole lot of them going, dealing, finding love after coming back. Um, so those ones were fun. Um, well, hold on just for a second. Yeah. Can we get a moment of silence for Nick's bank account if he bought 16 books in 14 days? Sorry, Nick. Moment of silence. All right. In all, fairness, in all fairness, my Mother's Day gifts were all books and bookmarks. That's fair. Okay. That's fair. You should share the, uh, the, the bookmarks on your Twitter that we linked to in the link tree. Oh, I did send them to you. Aren't those great? They were awesome. They were horror themed, so you really should share them. Um, and you're going to be listening to this in June, but uh, go back to May, uh, second week of May, and look for those. She's going to share them because this is recorded um, on Mother's Day. The current one that I just started, I finished book one out of five, um, is about, it's actually fantasy. It's about uh, a mortal that gets punished by having to go and live in the fae world amongst the fairies and they're not normal fairies they're pretty gruesome scary fairies they're scary fairies at least some of them and i i'm here for it i just started book two um while this the movie we're reviewing today was playing in the background and i was just in there like do i have to do this show because I was so into this story, but it's fun. It's a, definitely a fun set. If you like fairies, if you like the fae, that is definitely a fun set. Um, I actually found that one on TikTok. Um, everybody was geeking out about it. And so we ran to Target, saw the price at Target. I was like, let me check Amazon just in case. And he's like, no, we can't afford this right now. Next thing I know, Mother's Day, it's sitting on my kitchen island. And I'm like, oh. Well played, Nick. Well played. Yeah, so I was super excited. That's um a, one of the other sets. And then the last set was me revisiting um a formerly popular book. Formerly popular book from back in the, the earlier 2000s. You're sort of shading at what you're hinting at? Okay. Women like to read it a lot. Oh, At least 50 oh. of them. All right. So I actually I bought the box set of the Titans Mage that uh, Edie Sky HP Hollow because she was talking about it. And I'm like, Mages and or uh, Mechs and Fantasy, like I'm I'm here for it, right? Like I, I I've never read anything like that. And it's been interesting. Obviously, I will write a review, but it will not be under my um mother assigned pen name because they are just my initials everyone's like how did you pick your pen name i'm like ah, they gave it to me at birth um but the um because wow the it does have the steam factor which is not on brand for me but the writing is really good so i'm gonna have to go back and check out her hp hollow stuff so i can actually share and talk about that a little more freely because she's got a good authorial voice yeah that's the word i'm looking for it's very conversational and like just fun and irreverent and I can dig that because the world it gets maybe it's because politics are creeping up on us with the election and, and all the trials on the news. And I just keep thinking, yeah, I don't want to think about any of that. So I just want something fun and like brain popcorn. Yep. I um the Four Horsemen series. I think I told you about that last week did, when I was did. actively reading them. Um, that I think you would definitely like them. There is some adult in it, but um <laughs> Definitely All I'm going to say is, Nick, I'm going to need at least 10 Hail Marys for this, right? <laughs> it's such a fun, it's such a fun um, set of books. I couldn't put it down. And I enjoyed the way that the author wrote it so much that I went and I found 
her other series of books and those just arrived right before the podcast. So when I finish my Fey land, my fairy land uh, set, I will be moving on to uh, the second set from the same writer as the four horsemen, because I'm really, I'm really excited to see if I love all her work as much as I loved four horsemen. So I've been doing a lot of doing that. I'm doing all the game lit, um, lit RPG type stuff, but there's a heavy like isekai portal deal type going on. And I don't know enough about anime or any of the um, Japanese entertainment to know if I'm going to like all of it. Cause some of that and um, skirting the boundaries to keep it family friendly has some very interesting tropes that I'm not sure I'm brave enough for. So we'll see. <laughs> And we'll just leave it at that. But yeah, I'm going to read the, um, since I liked her Titans Mage, I'm definitely going to check out her, um, oh, I can't remember the name. We, we talked about it too, her HP Hollow uh, Lit RPG thing um, that she did. So I'm going to check that out too. And then I'm going to see, you know, what what uh, Amazon recommends. If you like this, then buy that. Um, and then I'll go from there and sort of see what happens. Because it's just, it's, like I said, it's irreverent. It's fun. It's not serious. It doesn't take itself seriously. And I think the world could use a little bit of that right now. The um, the books that I'm reading right now, um, I'll pull them up and I'll tell you what they are, or I'll write them in the, the side notes so you know later. But um, the books that I'm reading right now, they're like that, but the first words out of my mouth when I opened the first book was, holy shit, there's a map. <laughs> <laughs> I like maps. I do There's like the a map. whole map showing all the different parts of the Fey realm, of the mortal realm, like where our protagonist village is, where our antagonist lives. Like it, it was just so perfect that that was the first thing out of my mouth. And of course, Nick was at work. So I'm over here like, let me take a picture of this. Let me look. I mean, now I have this. ideas because I'm a sucker for a map. Uh, so I'm with you. We even did an episode about maps that we talked about, like adding maps to books. I'd like to be able to do one where I can like do a print copy that has the map and then have special editions where the map is upside down. So we can mail it to all the officers. I'm like, no, sorry. It's upside down. <laughs> just to mess with the lieutenants. <laughs> I give it to them as their graduation gift or something. I don't know. It just seems amusing to me. Um, but that's cool. I, I dig a good map. It's a lost art in modern. Although like for the worlds I'm developing right now for some of the series, I, They've got some pretty cool programs for that. I, I just don't know enough. Like, do I really want to, I'm already not a fast writer. Do I want to spend the time to make the maps or, you know, and everyone that I know that does commissions, they're all closed for commissions right now. So I'm like, eh, I don't know. We'll see. Um, I, I did the have, books in the map. So you can. Nice. So, you can so I it. did uh, one of the series I was working on with James at the time of his passing the, um, the game lit stuff. Um, his family has reached out. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, to finish that just because it was so much fun. That's why, I, that's how I found like the game lit genre to read it. I'm like, man, this is a lot of fun. So I started finding other stuff in the genre and kind of went from there. Um, so it's like, it's, it's all the fun of fantasy without the seriousness of Tolkien basically. So, all right. All right. Now that we got that out of the way, we're half an hour in, you know what, let's just do the commercial and then we'll jump into the episode. So that way, you know, we just get it out of the way. All right. Since it's a horror movie, we got a horror commercial. When a strange symbol is found at a burned down historical site, Houston arson investigator Emmy Anenzo goes to work. As mysterious and inexplicably hot fires break out across the drought ravaged city, she finds herself digging through the ashes of history. It's a race against time to track down the serial arsonist and explain the seemingly impossible heat of the fires. As strange evidence begins to pile up, Amy wonders if the arsonist is insane, or even worse, possessed. Can Emmy and her colleagues find and stop him before the entire city burns? Parsec award-winning author Paul E. Cooley wraps ancient mythology around an eerie contemporary tale that will leave you burning for more. Gare's Inferno, a free podcast novel available from shadowpublications.com and iTunes. Some mysteries shouldn't be solved. All right. Thank you for sticking with us through that commercial interlude. So 
before we get started on a review, the same as we always do, we'll give you the blurb about the or the description of the movie. We'll show you the trailer. We'll talk about the characters, the plot, the world building, the cinematography. That is where Nick will get super artsy fartsy because he has a degree in it and he might as well use it. We'll look at the movie poster and then we'll give our overall opinion. Um, and so with that out of the way, let's give you the movie details just so you can follow along at home. So this movie is called The Stuff, directed by Larry Cohen. It is free as far as the cost on Pluto. Links are in the show notes. Um, you can also buy it on Amazon, but I figure most of us are on a budget. So if there's a platform that can legally let you watch it for free, it is, I mean, it's, it's not a copyright. It's not piracy, none of that. Um, then we'll give you that link where possible. It cost $1.7 million to make. Nick, was that 1.7 now or 1.7 in, in 1985? Uh, 1985. I think that was... I don't, it doesn't really say whether it, 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 it's probably 1.7 back then. Or, wow. Yeah. It does sound kind of low for a movie now. I wonder what 1.7 million. Um, I it gives you a rotating movie. room. That's what it does. What is that? Some of their effects. It gets you a rotating room. That's how they shot some of the stuff where it looked like the uh, liquid was moving. All it was the room was turning, and so it was just gravity doing it. But the way the camera was situated, it looked like it's shooting from the bed and onto the walls and all that. Pushing the guy up the wall. Yeah. So um, let's see. That is um, hundreds. One point seven is five million today, roughly. Yeah, that wow, that's, that that's. Dollars changed a lot in value since 1985, I guess. Yeah. All right. The uh, the movie is one hour and 27 minutes long, or 87 minutes if you prefer. Uh, and it was released on June 14th, 1985, the Army's birthday. Woo -hoo. Um, Nick, is it, why did you enlist on that day on purpose? No, I had no idea. <laughs> that was just the day that I signed in. Okay. Got sworn in. Um, I will say the one thing the Marines get right. They do one heck of a birthday shindig. We, we could learn that in the Army. Yeah. But we weren't born in a bar either, so. They're reopening. Supposedly, uh, there's an organization that's buying land. They're going to reopen Tun Tavern as a historic yeah, bar right. slash museum slash, you know, Marine Corps Mecca, I guess. Yeah, crayons uh, for purchase in the gift shop. Absolutely. You know, you know, you and I are going to go down there just to see, you know, what the ale tastes like, just because yeah. you kind of have to. Yeah. And if they serve grog, don't drink it, people. You don't want to do that to yourself. Mm -hmm. Made that mistake once. All right. So the ad copy. So when a mysterious white and gooey but delicious substance begins oozing from the Earth's surface, it makes a great new dessert product. But this dessert has a sinister origin. It's an entity that takes over the victims' minds while making them crave more of it. You can never get enough. Of the stuff. All right. So, are you okay with that summary, Stabby? Um. Um. Yeah, I totally am. Uh, I totally freaked out my kid about it too because he's like, "Is it supposed to be like that marshmallow fluff?" And I'm like, "Fluff is the stuff." Now he is traumatized and will not eat. Fluff because he believes it is the stuff. More for and you. Peanut butter uh, and fluff sandwiches. I would have been the first person infected by the stuff. Throw a banana in there, mm -mm -mm. or or peanut butter fluff and maple syrup was another one I did as a kid. There's a reason I'm a recovering fatty. I liked all the good foods. Honey. Although that was pre army, so the army helped me get thin after that, and then I undid it with booze and good food i uh, just got um i just got a jar of local honey but they call it cowgirl candy and it has like uh dried bread that was soaked in like jalapeno juice so you get the sweet of the honey and the little bit of spicy and the little bit of crunchy because of the dried and it i would put that on a peanut butter and fluff sandwich I think we need to start the Blasters and Blades food cast as well to go with our podcast about nerdy stuff. Oh. All right, Nick, did you agree with the summary? Yeah, that's pretty accurate of, of what you're gonna what you're getting into. Yeah, I, I think they were pretty on the nose. Um, 
I did worry about giving almost like they gave away too much from the beginning, but I don't know. It didn't feel like it took itself too seriously, but we're looking at it a long time later, um, 40 years later. So I don't know if at the time it took, it was considered a serious movie or not. No, I mean, it's Larry Cohen. I mean, he's kind of like notorious for like campy stuff or schlock type cinema. So yeah, well, I don't definitely, think it, it didn't take it seriously. At the time, like or as far as like watching it now, it definitely didn't feel like it took itself too seriously. Um, and some of the the parts that were cutting edge as far as um, special effects back then, you look at it now and it's like funny, but it wasn't probably supposed to be funny. Like uh, like when the horror stuff was supposed to be happening and like you try to see the dog, for instance, when it gets the fluff. I was like, ah. Uh. Um, all right. So, Nick, can you show us the movie trailer? Yeah. Let's get that up here. As soon as my mouse wants to cross over, here we go. The show is here now. Great new day sensation. Light and free now. Get you elevation. Enough is never enough. Enough is never enough of the stuff. The stuff that it tastes that makes you hungry for more. The stuff taste that delivers. Enough is never enough. We interrupt this presentation with the following urgent message. Tonight, America is in grave danger. We are under alien attack by a popular dessert known as The Stuff. Here, Jason, take some. No, don't eat that. There is something alive in there. Tasty. There's something alive in yogurt. It's called benign bacteria. If the stuff is in your house, do not eat it. If you have it on your shelves, do not sell it. If you distribute this material, close your doors, make no more sales. Enough. It's never enough. <laughs> Showed us some of the special effects I was talking about. Would that have made you want to watch the movie? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I watched it because Stabby picked it, and we try to humor her because she humors us. But uh, yeah. I would have watched it just because I like campy, cheesy movies, so it would have been okay for me. Yeah, it's akin to, like, The Blob and the remake. So, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I like those types of movies. They're, they're campy, they're fun, it's it's popcorn for the brain. Yeah, what about you, Stabby? I definitely think that everybody should see the stuff. Because it's just fun. Like, I, I'm sitting there watching it for the 12th, 13th, 14th time in the last couple of years because I, I just love it. Um I didn't see it until it actually came across um, Shutter on Joe Bob Briggs' um, show, the the Last Drive-In, and he gave his review on it. He talked about it throughout it, and um, he gave it his four stars. And I absolutely, I, I was like, okay, well, Joe Bob says it's good. Let's find out. And so I watched it, and I was like, that's just fun. That's just fun. Okay. So, it had some notable actors. Um, the guy that was Char uh, Charles W. Chocolate Chip Charlie Hobbs. Um, I just remember the Chocolate Chip Har uh, Charlie because it was funny. That was Garrett Morrison who was in the Jeffersons. Um, which you know, if you're if you're a child of the '80s, you know that show. I don't know if um, the bad guy Colonel Spears. He was um, Paul Sorovino. He's in a lot of like crime drama type shows is the bad guy. Oh, he was in Goodfellas. Um, yeah. And his, his daughter is an actress too, uh, Mia Servino. Okay. Um, I don't know if there were any other um, noticeable or notable 
actors because I mean they're they're period actors, so they would have probably been in stuff before I was paying attention. Let's see here. Um, we got Michael Moriarty, who um, was in a lot of um, B movies and horror movies in the eighties. Yeah. Law and Order. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brian's um, Jason's brother, the the actor that played him in that bit part, which was the little kid that you see in the series, he was in the A team. Yeah. yeah. In in the Avengers. He was the voice of um, Captain America in the Avengers uh, Earth's Mightiest Heroes cartoon. Yeah, um, he became a voice actor. Yeah. Um, and then J John um, Hames Newton, who played the character Howard, was in Melrose Place. Uh, he was Ryan in Melrose Place. So, I mean, that's, I guess. But they were younger actors that had bit parts, so. Yeah. But, I mean, you had... You had uh, Paul Servino, you had Danny Aiello, um, Brian Bloom, um, Scott Bloom. They were brothers. Um, Both on screen and off. Off screen and oh. on screen. Uh, it, had, it had a bit part at uh, Laureen L Landon. Um, if you're familiar, she was one of the main characters in the sequel of Airplane. So it was Airplane 2, um, which I thought was kind of cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, it had a lot of like... Um, a lot of characters had one of the guys from um, Barney Miller's show. Um, I recognize his face. It was uh, Abe Vigoda, but I don't remember what his character was. Abe Vigoda. Yeah. yeah, he was just one uh, of the extras, but he was uh, Fish. He was Phil Fish in, in um, Barney Miller. Yeah. Uh, it had the lady, from the the commercial they did for the stuff in the meta in the movie uh, was the girl that did the Where's the Beef commercial for Wendy's back in the eighties. Yeah. Where's the stuff? I mean, she even used that line. She just, instead of beef, she put stuff in there. Yeah. That's how I noticed it. I'm like, why does that sound familiar? And then I was like, oh, okay. Um, but so who would you say the main characters of this were? Uh, I would say that it's uh, it's definitely Mo. Mo is the main protagonist, I think, because he's the one that you see the majority of the movie. And then you have Nicole, who's was kind of his sidekick. And Jason too, I would say the little boy. Yeah, J Jason's that kid in any type of adventure type show that you know is always getting into stuff. Yeah. Golly gee, Mister. Yeah, you know he's like trying to warn everybody, and then he ends up in he ends up in one of those in the um, in the trailer, the um, the delivery trailer. He's like, oh man, and he's so constantly he's taunting. Yeah, Stabby, do you agree with those three as we would say as the main characters, I guess? Uh, Nicole, Mo, and Jason? Absolutely. From the get-go, you know, um, Moriarty is just in every single scene. He is out to stop the stuff. Um, and he just kind of collects everybody else on the way. But you so got to give it to Jason for eating the Barbasol shaving cream to get away from his family <laughs> because if and you've ever seen, yeah. yeah if you've ever used barbasol you know that it's such a pungent smell <laughs> so we'll give you a little rundown without without spoiling the show long story short his family wants him to eat it because they've been taken over and he dumps it down the toilet and then he puts the the shaving cream in there and eats that in front of them so they think he's in the Borg. He's been assimilated, essentially. And then he pukes in the guy's car. And Mo, Mo was like, eh, we've all eaten a little shaving cream in our day. <laughs> he goes, can you uh, roll down the window now? <laughs> <laughs> so, although I will say the dad. So this is maybe he's already been taken over at this point. It doesn't really say. But like the kid is waking up in the south. It's hot. Like he's got mosquitoes getting up. So he goes down to get something to eat. And this is the opening scene. So I'm not giving anything away. And the dad's like, what are you doing? I thought you were a robber. And then he just starts wailing on the kid. I'm like, dude, the kid was just hungry. Like, what are you beating him for? I actually think that was probably before he was taken over because otherwise he would have wanted to eat the stuff. I, I can't say anything on that one. So I did not grow up in the best neighborhood. I can't say anything for them in the movie, but I did not grow up in the best neighborhood. So... <laughs> 
on the rare occasion that my teenager deems it that he is starving and he needs to get something to eat. I've, I've told him multiple times, if you're hungry, go get something to eat. I don't care if it's two o'clock in the morning, get yourself something to eat. Just don't make a whole meal in the middle of the night. And get yourself a snack. Eat it. Nick. Right. Um, get a stick, get a string cheese or something, just something to tide you until the morning until breakfast. But um I I did not hear him come out of his room. I just heard noise in the kitchen. <laughs> and my brain automatically went, intruder, intruder. So I grabbed the pew pew and I went in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> Luckily, Nick, you know, he, he did properly train me with my pew pew. So, you know, no booger pickers on the on the triggers. But uh, Kept he was just as startled as I was. I approve. <laughs> everybody, everybody said there, like. And get a positive ID before you let the pew pew fly. Yeah, they taught me that from the Boy Scouts on. Don't fly lead if, unless you want it dead. Yeah, so. it definitely, it, it spooked him a little bit. I think it spooked me more with the fact that not only did I have it in my hand, but that was my kid in the kitchen, you know, kind of spooks the parent a little bit more like, oh my God, that could have been so bad. Um, yep. But then he was also spooked because mom just came barreling into the kitchen with a pew. <laughs> He'll learn to uh, he make sure quiet. to walk past my bedroom door now. If he's going into the kitchen, he doesn't go the other way through his bathroom. He comes, he comes straight past my bedroom door, so I see him walking past. So I'm I know just saying, you taught him a valuable lesson in light and sound discipline. Is all I'm saying. Turn on a light. Don't stand in the dark. <laughs> so uh, we've talked about who the main characters are. Did you like the main characters? I thought they were all very likable. I wasn't a huge fan of Nicole when she first came into um, into the movie. When she was first introduced, I was like, mm, I don't know about this. But then as it went on and she kind of found her backbone, I was like, okay, okay, I can get behind her. She was just kind of mercenary with her, like, I'm going to do this because they're paying me a crap ton of money to sell this product. And then she found out what was really going on. And so as much as she's a cold hearted and mercenary about that, the business side, she also had a heart. So as soon as she was like, holy crap, I was selling what? And suddenly she's on board to undo it. So it's like, I mean, if you're going to be mercenary, but with principles, I can dig that. That's how you know it was fiction. I have never met an ad executive that wouldn't sell their soul to the devil and their mother too. <laughs> so what did you think about Nicole? Um, I think... She and it's, it's really weak. It's really weak character development because you do see that transformation where she was she sold the stuff and the stuff was pretty easy to sell because of how infectious it was. So it's really, you didn't really have to sell too much, but she did, she was there in the beginning to help it get marketed so it became popular. She's um, the one who named when, it. She's the one that named it because um, they, I think that there's a scene in there where they're like brainstorming the name for stuff. He's like, well, why don't we just call it the stuff? And they're like, okay. And it went, you know, stuff, fluff. We're seeing the correlation there. Um, you know, and you see her character development where she actually starts. And that executive with a soul, that's what the title should have been. But uh, no, I, I, I thought Nicole was uh, a pretty good co-protagonist, sidekick, I guess. Um, she was a little bit more than a sexy lampshade. Yeah, I'm on the fence if she would be a secondary character or, or co-main character. I, I, I could see – you could make an argument both ways, and I'd buy it. Well, another argument you can make is that it's um, three people with a converging story. So they yes. all have their own little things. You know, like Nicole's brought into it because Moriarty's in there doing his uh, espionage, sabotage stuff. Um, Jason's brought into it because he's like the, the ear on the ground, the man on the street, even though he's a child. You know, he's the one that like knows like something's off, you know, and they and all three of these characters are just kind of like in a collision course with each other, as we see um, later. in the Rendezvous part. with destiny, you might say. Ooh, yeah, that, there you go. A rendezvous with destiny. No, that could have been another title for it, but I don't think it would have had the same horror aspect. I think when they were naming this movie, it was like, uh, I think they were they were going for something along the lines of like the blob, some of those classic 
um, like 1950s um, horror movies, you know, that the scream is going to be cheesy or it wasn't going to age well. You, you recognize what that was from, right? The Rendezvous with Destiny? Please tell me you passed that test. I had a stroke, man. Part of my memory was affected. It was the speech before the jump into Normandy uh, for the 101st. Oh, yeah. The Rendezvous with Destiny. Um, and so, like, I like... Okay, so you, you talked about Nicole. What do you think of Mo? Because uh, Stabby answered that one already. Oh, Mo is... He was a charming dude, man. It, like, <laughs> Nicole falls for him, like, right away. And this he guy just techie. uses his charm. He was techy before, like, in the 80s when tech was, like... Like cutting edge was he had listening devices, right? Oh yeah. And so I I liked him too. I liked Nicole, but I, I see what you mean about her character. Kind of the arc felt like forced. Uh, it almost like they they needed a longer movie to sell that a little bit more. And there uh, was a longer there's a longer cut of this movie, and it was supposed to be a little bit more sophisticated and intellectual, <laughs> if you can believe that. Um, and they they cut it way down for um, to speed up the pacing of the film. Okay, and maybe that's what was cut. Some of that was Nicole's story. Maybe that that explains it. Yeah, um, there there was a more in depth romantic involvement between Mo and Nicole. So I liked her character, but it, like, I agree with you. It was it was the weakest of the three. I liked Mo that he you know he was unashamedly um, mercenary about his like I'm a corporate espionage guy. I'm using my FBI ta talents for nefarious means because they fired me. So f those guys. Um, Did you notice? Um, the name drop that they that he had is like, hey, contact and see if you picked up on it. Frank Herbert from the FBI. Yes, I got was, that was Hoover. I was like, yeah, but he's but it, it was a name drop because Frank Herbert is the author and creator of Dune. Oh, I was thinking it was um, the Hoover. It was a, it was a play on Hoover. No, he, he, it was name drop in a. Uh, because the dude, because yeah, it, it, it it made me think that when I when I was thinking back on it because then when he talks to Colonel Spears at the end who we'll talk about as a secondary character, um, he remembers he's like oh I was spying on you about this incident and I'm the one who mailed the pictures to your wife and he's like I should kill you for that and he goes but that's not why I'm here. Um, I'm like I, I don't know that I would lead with I'm the guy who outed you to your wife right right like for the FBI when I'm standing in a oh, tower. your divorce and you got taken to the you know to the cleaners yeah that was me man sorry um but so like I liked I liked him always a character I, I felt like he was the the most developed I think Jason was because you know as a child of the 80s myself like I could relate to you know what they were showing as his experience I even had probably some of those same dorky clothes that were popular back then um, oh yeah I know I did I mean, I had a mullet in the 90s for crying out loud. And no, no pictures of that exist anymore. I made sure of that. Um, but like, so I, I, I don't know. I, it could have been us. I think that's why the relatability factor of, of Jason. I mean, as far as characters go, he was the weakest of the three as far as character development and acting. Yeah. But then again, but like. Mean, is, that's kind of, that's kind of the trend first. of those movies. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. But, but you had that trend in the in the mid 80s um, with child actors. And so you had movies like the stuff where you have Jason and then you have Monster Squad and you had the Lost Boys. And then you had uh, was, oh there was a movie called Rooskies um, about a bunch of kids that uh, oh, there's a Russian submariner who gets like they were. He was on like a, an away team on the coast of, I want to say it was like Florida or something like that. And he gets left behind. And so these kids find him and try and like help him evade capture by the CIA or something like that. It was a really weird movie for the time because it was all during. Like, Why would scare. a Cold Warrior Americans want to help him get away? Because they were kids. Oh, yeah. And then one of the one of the kids' dads was like a military officer. So you have this like cloak and dagger cat and mouse thing going on. But that's that's a movie for another time if you can even find it. That was kind of like a trend during the during the eighties was putting um, a relatable child character in there, even if it was a horror movie. Um, so it was like their way of saying, like, "Hey, this movie's for the whole family, kind of." <laughs> so I will say that back then you didn't see as many child actors like you do nowadays. So the talent pool was probably a little less. It's not like you're getting some of these like I don't know 
top tier production type movies, they got top tier production talent with the children too. And so you, you see yeah. in movies back then, the child acting was always a little more stilted because it was the emphasis with their kids. Let them be kids. Yeah. Which is where it's, you get uh, well, high school kids played by four year old dudes, you know, was the joke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like nine or two and oh. Yeah. Um, so when the plot didn't change when they went to college, you knew maybe the beginning was a little off. Um, so yeah, I, I would say Jason of the three was the most um, relatable, just because you know we grew up in that same time, uh, but the least developed, I think. So let's go on to secondary characters. So I mentioned two. We had Chop Chocolate Chip Charlie, and I mentioned Colonel Spears. Those were my two favorite. Um, I liked the Jeffersons growing up, so seeing him was just cool. And then he was doing the "My hands are lethal weapons," registered with Missouri or whatever state law enforcement. And then, of course, he has this FBI guy kicking his butt like he's nothing. And I'm like, lethal weapons, my ass. He was on Saturday Night Live, too, back in the 70s. Um, yeah. Back in Chevy Chase and Steve Martin were on there. And he is officially the first live-action Ant-Man. Oh, okay. But, yeah, I like Chocolate Chip Charlie because you can relate to the guy that's family sold him out. Right? Yeah. Like, they sold him out for some money. Uh, and he just wanted – he wanted vengeance. Um, so I liked him. And the name Chocolate Chip Charlie is just kind of cool um, as it goes. Yeah. And then I liked Colonel Spears. I got the impression he was supposed to be like a Rush Limbaugh type, but if, if Rush had been in the military, because he's like preaching conspiracy theories on late night radio and he's got his own militia. Um, yeah. But he's also kind of racist. So, I, but he was so funny. It was the 80s. And every, every, it's like, it's the 80s. Everybody racist once in a while, you know? Well, like no, the he dying like, breath of like, racism in the country. He didn't want uh, Charlie in his studio because I won't have you preaching any of that communist propaganda. Well, I don't. Uh, okay, so it wouldn't be actually racist then. It would be. Uh, well, well, the implication that was he was black. He assumed he was liberal. Was the way the way I read it was because of this. I assume this. We won't have any of that here. Um, and so, uh, I don't know. But I, I thought he was funny because he was so like. Oh yeah. So, so much of a shtick, less than it was like, he, I mean, him, yeah, cookie cutter 80s tough guy. But it was like if Rambo had gotten fat and old and became racist, that's what I got the impression. And he was a colonel instead of a sergeant. Yeah. Because he's got all yeah, these kids running too. around with like in the militia, just waving these a, uh, M16 A1s around, which was like, I'm, I recognize that rubber ducky because I see the seal. I carried one at boot camp myself. Um, oh, yeah. Before they painted him orange. Yeah. So, like, I don't know. I kind of like the character. And I guess we were all afraid of militias back in the day. We're going to be the next terrorist threat. It's the, you know, the big scary militia in the yeah, 80s. Them and cults. Militias and cults were, like, the biggest. Like, I remember that as a kid. Like, oh, they're. And devil they're worship in, uh, in quicksand. Yeah. Devil worship in quicksand. Yeah. Got to add that in there. But yeah. so what about you guys? Quicksand was going to be a further danger as I got older. And it turns out. I'm kind of disappointed that it wasn't. <laughs> um, but uh, what about you, Stabby Nick? Who did you like for your secondary characters? The stuff. Okay, I can the see that. The stuff was a character. character. It was totally a character, and and anybody that says it wasn't is out of control because you see how much it has, like mentality when they're sleeping and the pillow cracks open and it just. Over his face. It was freaking beautiful. How the hell did it get in the pillow? It was very sneaky. Very, very sneaky. It was preloaded for him. They knew he was going there because there's only one. Oh, yeah. They sent him there. Okay, but I'm just they saying, if you watch how it behaves, how it, it comes out, it doesn't go after her. It goes after him. And it straight up over his face. And I was like, that's it. See? It, it's, it's so much more. And they showed it as well when um, Jason was flushing it down the toilet, when you see it start growing out of the toilet. Like, it's like, it's, no. like Yeah. I know okay. what you're laughing about over there, too. There Nick. You. Nick, uh, what, about you? what was your favorite secondary character? <laughs> Hold on. I gotta finish laughing the fact that Mo got bukkakied by the stuff. Told you. <laughs> Uh, oh, um, secondary character. Oh man, um, I like Chocolate Chip Charlie. 
I thought he was great. Um, Colonel Spears was good too. Um, even uh, Jason's brother, um, even though like like I think the stuff kind of like takes over personality traits of whoever it's like infected because he like the brother was still just like you always get everything you want. It's always about you, Jason. You know. So I I thought he was funny. I don't I don't know if I'd call him yeah, my so, favorite, but yeah, he was a good um, caricature of the abusive older sibling that's just bullying their little sibling. Yeah, which you know is just it's normal brother or sibling relationships just kind of like dialed to eleven. Oh oh, and the dog that gets taken over by the fluff because for whatever reason Holmes is like I feed it to my dog too, and then when the dog's head splits open, which you saw in the trailer. Oh. And the stuff so just cool. comes out is like that if you if you pause it because I did right on that scene and you can see like the claymation that they used to make that it is so cheesy that it is awesome. It's like uh, we couldn't get Harry Housen, so we did our best. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the dog I, I, that almost is a secondary character because it's like the dogs possessed by the fluff, the stuff. Well, this is a lot better than like I would say Cohen's some of his earlier films like uh, Q the flying serpent, which is horribly awesome. It's just, it's one of those movies that's so bad. It's good. Um, and that also has more uh, Moriarty in it too. Um, well, that's the name from Sherlock Holmes. Holmes. It was, I was one of the antagonists of Holmes. Moriarty was. No, the act, the actor's name, the guy that played Mo, his last name is Moriarty. Michael Moriarty. I thought Michael. Okay, okay. Rutherford is his last time. I thought the character's name yeah, was he, Moriarty. Since his nickname was Mo. No. They never explain why his nickname was Mo. They did. Like they his, did. Because he says he always wants Mo. They, Give me Mo. Always wants Mo. Mo money. Yeah. And then when the the corporation that hires him or that makes the stuff, he like he hands him that envelope and just just from the way he's like thousand dollar bills about twenty five, and then. He doesn't even accept. Tell him that he accepts the job as security. He just puts it in his pocket, and walks out, and grabs Nicole. <laughs> that made um, me jump. Yeah, it's it's nice. It's nice. Um, so, yeah, I, there was a lot of this movie. For all it was cheesy, and it, you know this, the special effects and stuff didn't age well. The movie itself was still good. Um, yeah, I think it's the classic horror trope where you don't see the monster until you do. And so it leaves you in suspense for a lot of the movie. I mean, like you see it move in the fridge in the beginning, but like what it's yeah, doing, it. yeah, it, it was just drags it out, which I liked. It was almost like a gumshoe detective movie, except for it was horror, you know? I would say that it was probably more a detective movie than it is a horror movie. It doesn't become a horror movie to like the last 15, 20 minutes. You know, it just, elu it's, there's a lot of like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Like sleuthing. subtext of what was going on. Sleuthing, yeah. It's like there was a lot of detective stuff going on and, and him gathering all the pieces. And then instead of going and busting the bad guy, you know, you encounter the alien that's, <laughs> you know, been mass marketed and produced and people were paying, well, I, I don't even assume what they were paying for in 1985 for a tub of stuff. It was probably somewhere around like two bucks, but... So um, what do you think about the plot overall? So that would be like the idea of the story arc, how the action, the pacing, was it easy to follow? That kind of thing. I, I thought say, it was. I, I thought it was easy to follow. I thought the pacing yeah. worked. I watched the 87 minute version. So if there, if you watch the longer one, your mileage may vary. Um, I thought the pacing was good. Um, it was very easy to understand what was going on. There was no ambiguity, no cliffhanger. It was just clear cut, good versus evil man versus monster. So on my end, I thought they did a good job on the, on the plot. What about you, Stabby and Nick? I, I, I just loved everything about it. I loved the, it was so well-timed. I think that's my thing. And, and when it comes to me and horror movies, I know who the bad guy is usually off the, off the get. And I was like, well, there's not a person behind it. That's crazy. <laughs> it definitely kept me guessing till the end. I, I was very, um, 
I I would I, I would say that it it's it's in my top ten of movies. Like that's why I kept pushing us to do this review. I was like, no, Jr., you need to see this movie because it's just it's just all around fun, and it doesn't really even get scary. So people that like you know don't like being like super scared and with the jump scares and all that. I think this would be a good one for them. Okay, yeah. Nick, thoughts on the plot, the pacing, etc. I, I thought the pacing was well, well done. Um, it was easy to follow. It's something I put in the side chat. It's like one of those movies where you can follow along while you're messing around on your phone. You know, I thought it was pretty good. Um, even when there is the quote unquote horror aspects when people are like dissolving or, you know, the stuff's coming out of them or when I think probably the most, um, I don't know, gruesome part was when the dog splits open. Um, that's probably the most horrorous, like, like where it's be considered gory, but there wasn't any blood. It was just the stuff coming out. And then you got to see a little bit of the inside of the dog's head. But no, I, th I thought it was a well-made movie for, for what it was. Um, I don't think it's something that should be remade. I don't, I don't think it would have the same impact or the same, um, same fun as with, with the original. So um, I think part I, of I that is, Part of that is this was made when they were still doing the movie sensor. So what could you could make was limited, I think. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I agree with you. Like I, one of the cool things they did, for instance, was when Chocolate Chip Charlie, when his head pops open, like, they used, like you said, you saw it on the trailer and the stuff starts coming out of him. It look, his looks like chocolate chips are coming out with it. <laughs> if you caught that. Yeah. I was like, I think I, did I just see what I thought I saw? Which I thought was just kind of funny because, you know, it's coming out of Chocolate Chip Charlie. Yeah, so Chocolate Chip stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which which I just thought was like a little on the nose, but sometimes there's room for that in the movie. Okay, so oh, what about the world? Yeah. world? Go ahead. No, that's, that's, that was just cracking up. About no, the that. world building. Uh, so how flesh out was the world? Did we buy it? Could we envision themselves there? Uh, for me, I would say yes, because it was basically the 80s. I grew up there, so like everything looked familiar. I remember like all the, the buildings and restaurants and stuff they're showing. Like I've been to places just like it. Um, so for me, it was just like, oh, my childhood. Okay, yep, I'm Gare. Um, what about you guys? Yeah, um, I could smell most of that movie based on like the, yes. the locations, the, the restaurants, things like that, because um, the 80s had a smell. <laughs> you know, everything was like had like a hint of oil or grease to it. I don't know what it was, but right. I just distinctly remember everything was kind of smelled greasy or oily. It smelled yeah. like wood paneling. That too. Yeah. <laughs> wood paneling everywhere. Um, there was that, and it definitely uh, the the mat. Oh, my lightsaber is charged. Uh, the consumerism that was going on in the eighties, like that was a big thing like just consume consume buy 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 and everything was like like if you watch commercials from back in the day it was always like a big production you know i think the the in-world commercial for the stuff really capitalized on that and really just kind of showed what the 80s was like so it's almost like a um it's a time capsule you know yeah like and if you we mentioned it the 80s, when we were talking about the characters but the lady that did the famous where's the beef 1984 uh wendy's commercial um when she was eating the patty and it's where's the beef in the sandwich. And then, Oh, Wendy's is real beef. Um, she did the, where's the stuff commercial at the fancy restaurant. Uh, and it's almost word for word, shot for shot. But instead of at a fast food restaurant, it's now at this fancy restaurant. And it's yeah, the beef, high it's end. The yeah. The high end restaurant. And her dinner looked kind of bomb. I was kind of disappointed that she was disappointed in it. I know. Right. I'm like, man, that looks like a well done steak. So what about you, Stabby? Did you buy the world building? I know you're younger, so you weren't a child of the 80s. So we just had to talk about this the other day. Cause because there's if if you scroll even for like an hour on TikTok, there's everybody arguing about how the elder millennials need to stop claiming Gen X and and Gen X will never accept any of the elder millennials. And what it comes down to is your the way you were raised. That's what I've come down to. Because if you were raised in a poor family, the 80s didn't end until like 1999. 
<laughs> you give me my back my house, baby mats. My house. Growing <laughs> up. Was Sweet was laser stuck. disc. <laughs> was stuck in the 80s until about 97, 98. Um, I was raised just like you crazy kids. I was kicked out of the house right after I finished my homework. And I was told to come back when the streetlights came on. Um, if mom had to go anywhere, it was don't open that door. Don't answer the phone. And if you do, I'm going to beat you. <laughs> like, yeah, I was not life. raised. I was not raised like a millennial at all. And I and think I that's think where... where I think that's where that uh that um that line is drawn. I'm not really so, a millennial, but I'm not really Gen X. So I, everything I in that movie makes perfect sense to me. Makes I mean, perfect I was sense. making a, a joke. I didn't mean we'd go that deep. I just was making a joke that Nick married someone younger than him. But I will say, no, they say it's, it's it's crazy because um because it. it you would never guess. You would never guess. But my mom always said I had an old soul. And I was like, yeah, because look how I was raised. So so they say anyone born from like 78 to roughly 84 is like a half generation anyway. Because we don't go with the generation before or the generation after. Because tech grew up as we grew up. So it was a very wholly unique experience. So like, I get what you're saying. Um, they, they have another half generation at the advent of social media. Because their lives were vastly different than the people that came before and presumably after because their their teenage years or whatever happened with social media where everything is filmed. All I'm going to say is I'm glad my stupid shenanigans as a kid did not have like cell phone high def cameras. Kept me yeah. up jail. I'm just saying. I might be able to run for office because the dumb stuff I did as a kid was never documented. It's just in memories. <laughs> I mean, the worst they've got of me is someone, and at one point in time it was on YouTube, uh, when I got back from Iraq the second time, um, we were going out to the, the NCO club because they, they wouldn't let us leave base, but we could drink there. And you had roving, like you had to rotate who had the sergeant of the guard, so you'd have to go pick people up. And uh, yeah. the sergeant of the guard was late, so I was, you know, inebriated, and I was very friendly. And so I proposed to a tree, and they filmed it. Um. And so that that video was floating around somewhere. It was a very lovely tree, might I say. And sadly, it did not marry me. So I am not a, a polygamist because I didn't marry the tree and my wife. But um, I'm just saying it was a nice tree. All right. Don't judge. That tree was a hose teaser. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is the same night of the famous Caucasian ops that I made the jokes about uh, with that meme. Um, oh, my. She, uh, she was like trying to get yeah. me to shut up. I know you're going to be shocked that I'm talker when I'm drunk, like really, really like motor mouth level. I know shocked. And she was trying to get me to shut up. And she's like, JR, it's black ops. You need to be quiet. So I was loudly telling her I couldn't do black ops because I was Caucasian. So I was going to do Caucasian ops. And then she dropped me off because she was so irked at me. She dropped me off at the wrong barracks. So we went into the Navy barracks because that was the, um, at Fort Dix, they oh were doing my. their weekend warrior stuff for the Navy reserves. And we thought they were in our room. So they're like four infantry grunts that had just come off of a year and a half of gun truck duty. And we've got some overweight swabbies that we think are in our room, but it was their room. So six of us, more of them, I'm just saying their chief got really upset when they went to the hospital and we didn't. And so he took us to our first sergeant. So our first sergeant would chew us out. And he started giggling <laughs> like a schoolgirl. So we just had to stand in the corner for five minutes. And that was our punishment. Like, don't you do that again, Sergeant Handley. So that was that was Roger a heck of a show. Roger Roger Roger. Anyway, back to the movie. I see you got me sidetracked. It's all Stabby's fault. It's her fault this time. So so we talked about like the world building because it was our childhood, right? So we could relate. Um, yeah. including everyone smoking everywhere, including while they're pumping gas. Oh yeah, because gas wasn't flammable in 1985. <laughs> right, it wasn't flammable in 1985. So all right, so what do you yeah, yeah. What did you guys think of the cinematography? Yeah, for um, for a movie of that type, um, yeah, I thought it was it was well done. My general rule is if it's not Blair Witch Project making you want to puke, like with dizziness, yeah. I'm good. Like I, I don't have a lot of expectations. I think 
if the shot it either it's either hit or miss it's one of those things where you either get on it's an a or it's a it's an e right like there's no middle ground with cinematography i don't think and this one did what it was supposed to do it set the tension it set the mood it showed what we needed to see and hit off camera what we didn't so uh, it's a good for me yeah it, it didn't come off as like a b movie you know like you're straight to video type um no as far as like film quality cinematography things like that they even tried to do some fancy zooms um to add tension which even today, I think it's silly when they do that. Like the the overly expressive face and the camera's like, you know, right in their face. I'm like, you don't need to do that. But yeah. Yeah, it came off like a big production, you know, for the time. Yeah, it did. It did. So I'm pulling up the um, – the Stabby, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, I think – if you're a horror buff like me and Nick and you watch all the 80s movies, there's things that you'll notice that they definitely reused in the stuff. So the scene where um, the stuff does start coming out of the pillow, it starts pushing the one guy up the wall. That's the same spinning room that they used in um, in Nightmare on Elm Street when um, I cannot remember her name, but huh tina tina was was being sliced and diced by freddie while her boyfriend sat in the corner and you know had to watch and then it was also the same room that they used when johnny depp got pulled down through the um through the bed and then all the blood came rushing out of it to hit the ceiling they used that same rolling room and that's the same room that they used for the stuff just instead of you know all the the gore coming out of it it was fluff I really liked yeah. that a lot. And if you watch the old, you know, 80s horror movies, you you notice that a lot of them really like the spinning room. I didn't even catch that it was spinning, but... All right, you don't so... know that it's spinning because of the way that they film it. So the actors that appear to be upright, they're actually buckled to the wall. And then the person that is being shoved up the wall to the roof and everything, they're not buckled into anything. So as they rotate the room, that actor starts, you know, following the walls and the everything while the ones that are buckled, they still seem like they're still upright, even though at that point they're upside down. <laughs> Interesting. It's, neat. Right, so it's a neat trick. We're going to show the, um, the movie poster. So this is the movie poster as it aired. You see Jason and his family um, on the picture. So, I mean, it's not the best because, again, 1985, as far as, like, it's a little bit pixelated. I, I couldn't find a high-def version because this is a picture of the poster. But, I mean, I, I liked it. I thought it did a job. It gave the, the kind of creep factor. It shows you the stuff. Thoughts? I like it a lot, actually. It it gives you that 1980s feel to it. That, you know, that grainy, grotesque, you know this is supposed to be a horror movie feeling. Yeah, this is the other one. I, I don't think this was the original one, though, because I didn't show this one once. No, this it. is the, uh, I think this was the, uh, the box art for the VHS. Yeah, that's what I found, too. Um, and so I liked it. Um, I think this does a good job too. This makes it look a little darker than the movie actually was. Although I don't yeah. know if you look at it horror for the day where the stuff stacks up, but I still think it probably wasn't as scary as like nightmare on Elm street. No, I, I think it was a different, I don't even know how to categorize it. It's more of a creature feature than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I could see that. That's how I would categorize it. So, uh, Stabby, have anything to say about the poster? You good? Um, it's it's an okay poster. It's not my favorite. Um, my mind went a different direction with it, but I'm not going to say that on air. So, moving on. All right. So, moving on. The overall um, thoughts on the movie. I, I liked it. I think it's a horror cl a horror classic, definitely a creature feature classic. I, I put it up there with uh, like The Blob because um, I've made that comparison throughout throughout the show tonight. Um, yeah, I, I give it four out of four stars. Check it out. Okay. 
Um, Stabby? I'm the one that was telling you guys to do this one. Why are you asking me? Of course I love this movie. I've been telling you for months to do you, this you one. You get mad at me. You forgot me again, JR. Well, stop forgetting me. Look, if you get blown up 27 times, your memory would be a little spotty too. Oh, honey, I got struck by lightning. You want to play? I mean, <laughs> people pay good money to do that at certain establishments is all I'm saying. You know what? I'm I'm gonna send you a jar of the stuff. I'm gonna personally mason jar you stuff and send it to you. When I get taken over and die, I'm just saying it's all your fault. You're not gonna die. All right, so you get toasted and roasted. <laughs> Nick, thoughts overall on this movie? Uh, I I love it. I think it's a I think it's a classic. It's a nice popcorn film. Uh, it's uh, if you're not really into horror movies. It's it like like we talked about. It it plays more of a detective tale up until like the last 20, 25 minutes. And no, it, it's just a fun movie. It's just fun to watch. Yeah, I was afraid like when I was watching it, I'm like, okay, I gotta like watch it on my laptop because it's it is an app. Like you can get the app on your Xbox or PlayStation or whatever. I watched it on the PC because I'm like, it's horror, so I can't watch it around the kiddo. And then I watched it, I'm like dude, he could have watched this. He might not have liked it, but he could have watched it. Yeah, it's very tame as far as horror movies are concerned, especially horror movies at that time where you had things like um, Friday the 13th, um, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Halloween sequels, you know, those, the slasher films of the 80s, which was kind of, you know, on brand for that that decade. You know, this was a creature feature, you know, and they tried to bring... During the 80s, they also remade The Blob, too, which was not as good as the Well, I don't know. Yeah, it's not as good as the original. But it's still entertaining. So, yeah, it's very mild. So it's like almost like family horror, <laughs> I guess. Like your kids could watch it, and they're not going to have nightmares. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I could see. Um, so now that we got that out of the way, dear listener, if you've got any movies you want us to review, because this is the end of the episode, we're about to tell you how you can find us. Um, if there's anything you want us to review, send it in. We do have a request for Beastmaster. We are working on getting that one on the books. But now that Nick's back uh, doing the day job, we are limited um, to to Tuesdays or Wednesdays or Mondays. And so you know, we, we, we'd have to plan that special to make it so Nick can be on that one. Uh, and there are certain episodes I just won't do if Nick isn't or Stabby can't make it because it's their jam. Like there are some topics like I don't know that they would find it as enjoyable as I do. I don't mind scheduling those panels when Nick can't make it. But for something like Beastmaster, which is one of your favorite movies, it would just feel wrong to do it without you. So I think it's going to take a little bit more planning on our part. I actually have Beastmaster on VHS, speaking of. No kidding. I burned out that VHS when I was a kid. I don't know if it still works because I don't have a VHS player anymore. Um, also but, on streaming now. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's a good movie. Okay. So, but uh, if you got anything else you want us to review, uh, any other topics, you can coordinate. Um, Stabby, given all the changes to the law with regard to TikTok, is our TikTok channel still up and running since you run that? It is. It is up and running. We are Blasters and Blades podcast. On, tick, on the Tiki Talkie. Um, actually, I believe if I'm not mistaken, because I was checking our Madam Stabby Stab email while you guys were chit-chatting about the cover art. And um, we have a few new followers. Uh, da, 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 da. If I can, you know, get there. But yeah, we are up and running. We are still, um, we're, yeah, we're, we're good. We're solid. Come find us. Outstanding. All right. So if you got anything you want us to review, books, movies, whatever, any topics you want us to talk about, it's a fan service. Like we, we're nerds just like you. So hit us up and we will um, we'll do the thing. And uh, we'll put those in rotations. Um, you can follow us on our link tree at L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E link tree slash Blasters and Blades podcast. Again, link tree slash Blasters and Blades podcast where we link to all the things, the bit shoots, the rumbles, the YouTubes, the TikToks, the Twitters, our email Blasters and Blades podcast at gmail.com for professional purposes only. I do check that at least once a week-ish. 
nobody really uses it. They mostly mail me directly. So uh, we have our Facebook group linked and our Facebook page. We have Madam Stabby Stab on Instagram, Twitter, and email. And we have our new website, which is uh, over on pod, pod, uh, excuse me, on Spotify's podcast site, which is a mouthful of garbly goop. So just trust me, go to the link tree, link tree slash blasters blaze podcast. We link to our podcast page where you can donate um, as little as 99 cents a month. You can help keep the lights on right now. Stabby and Nick and I sort of front the cost of this. And so when you donate to the podcast or you do- donate more directly to buymeacoffee.com slash author J.R. Hanley, again, buymeacoffee.com slash author J.R. Hanley, be sure to put in the comment sections for the podcast and I will keep my co-host duly caffeinated. Uh, but when you do that or when you f- use the code podcast grunts at the coffee brand coffee link in the show notes, um, you help keep the lights on. And we, we really do appreciate it. Like we'd probably be doing this for fun, but it, it helps. And it's kind of special to us that you guys like it enough that you help front some of that cost for us. Um, I and- just got an email while we were talking that um, coffee brand coffee just shipped our, our shipment. Nice. Um, and so one of the benefits is uh, as partners, we have a direct link to an agent uh, uh, with Coffee Brand Coffee. His name is Isaac. He seems really nice. And so if you guys ever have issues with your order, you can reach out to us and I can like make the magic happen in their Discord and you get customer service that much quicker because we are partners now. Um, right now, I think it's mostly Stabby and I buying the Coffee Brand Coffee for the podcast. So we're just getting a discount coming back to us of the money we're already spending. And Jenna. And Jenna Brown. The many, many uh, personalities therein. So, uh, but yeah, so every little bit helps and we really do appreciate it. Links in the comment section. Code is podcast grunts because, you know, Nick and I, once upon a time, we're knuckle dragging troglodytes. Uh, we try to be civilized now. Uh, sometimes we we make it. Sometimes Nick drops humor that is not family friendly. But, you know, you win some, you lose some. I'm definitely not the guy you put on speakerphone. Yeah, you're the guy that everyone warns their friends about. Like, hey, yeah, like we got oh, yeah. this really cool party. Like, we really want you to come, but but Nick's gonna be there. So you know, just don't take it too seriously. He doesn't mean it most of the time. I'm also the guy where when my friends are introducing me to new people. They look at me and they're like, "Now be nice." I'm like, "What? What I do?" You don't know how many times. In all like, fairness. Hey, in all fairness, Nick has to tell me to fix my face every time we're out with people. He's like, we're going to fix your face because this says everything that I refuse to say out loud. See, that got me in a lot of trouble because I somehow lost my straight like infantry face along the way with the TBI controlling that. It's sometimes a little harder. So there are a few times during COVID where I was on Zoom. And like, I appreciate uh, Mr. Hanley. You're not saying anything, but you're saying something. I'm just like, oh, oops. Points was it for the eye roll? Was it the eye roll? <laughs> was it the eye roll? <laughs> so, anyway, uh, with that being said, thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For my crazy co host, I am JR Haley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. And with that, we are out. Stabby, thank you for recommending it. It was a funny movie. We'll have to do more of these interspaced just for you to keep you entertained. I say the next thing that we do, we got to do Attack of the Killer Donuts. We also, it was recommended we do um, uh, Evil Something. The one that was like a spoof of all the the Hills Have Eyes type horror movies, but it's a comedy. Oh, uh, friend of the show, David Hensley was telling me about it. I will get it for you. It is right up your alley. It's a horror movie. Like one guy's diving at him and he ducks and doesn't know it. And the guy jumps into the wood chipper and it's supposed to be like a oh, play. Yeah. Tucker, and Tucker and Dale versus evil. Yes, that's it. Tucker and Dale versus evil. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, funny. That's so we've got to have a, some. That's a good one. We got to stack some up for Halloween week because it's going to be horror month all October. So that is Stabby's Here month. So we better shine. Did I show you what Jana sent me? Are you allowed to show this on the show or do we need to end this? Uh Uh-oh. I like it. I like Uh, it. Thank you, Jana. What? All right. And with that, we're going to hit the end button before we get ourselves in trouble. (laughs) Do-do-do.